So this is a talk on codling moth trapping by Chris Adams, Assistant Professor of Tree Fruit Entomology at Oregon State University. Much of my previous work was on trapping theory and probabilities of catch, but for this talk, I wanted to address the applied side of trapping. I wanted to start with this basic question, why trap for codling moth? What are we trying to do with trapping? I've listed five key things that trapping data can do. And in this talk, I'll briefly explain these five points. Number one, monitoring is key to IPM. So before we get started on the why, let's talk about how, beginning with where to hang the trap. Traps should be hung in the top third of the trees, not at eye level, within the canopy of the tree, not in between trees. The opening should not be blocked by foliage on either side and oriented so moths can easily fly into it. And the recommendations are one trap every two and a half acres. This diagram shows a paper from Helmut Riedel in 1979 demonstrating the difference in catch by trap height. The lure should be placed on a pin above the sticky bottom. This puts it up in the airflow moving through the trap and increases the pheromone plume structure. If the lure rolls around on the glue, it reduces the lure's efficiency. So trapping data provides decision support. In concert with phenology models, scouting, and field experience, trapping is really the foundation of IPM. Not long ago, people would spray based on the calendar. That is, they would spray based on some event like 21 days after full bloom. Since the trees and insect pests were evolved together, this method worked okay most years, but it was often off by days or even weeks in some years, meaning sometimes sprays were applied when there were no insects or sprayed too late. Trapping gave us an improved method using sex pheromone lure baited traps. We could establish the first sustained catch of moths, biofix, which allowed us to make better spray applications. For example, 250 degree days after biofix. Traps have enabled us to establish this biofix. Back in 1976, Helmut Riedel first established a phenology model for codling moth working in Michigan apple orchards. Thanks to pheromone lures, biofix defined as the first sustained catch in a lure baited trap indicates the beginning of the first generation of moths. I'm sure everyone's aware of the decision aid system by Vince Jones and now run by Dave Crowder. This is an excellent tool that provides accurate predictions of key life stages and spray timings. And these models were built and confirmed using trapping data over many years. This was a huge improvement in pest management over the calendar sprays. DAS is a great system, but we still need monitoring traps and eyes in the field. Small changes between orchards can impact the timing of populations and pesticide spray programs may impact insect phenology. Here is one study that showed that the timings were off between a managed orchard and an abandoned orchard. Now, I'm not suggesting that this study applies to all orchards, just that it's important to have eyes in the field. And this study illustrates how an unmanaged block or backyard trees could produce a source of pest pressure whose timing may not line up with the current spray program that you have in your orchard. So with the new no biofix model, do we really need traps? Here are some of the arguments against trapping that we've heard. Low populations mean that the first moths may not be caught. Incorrect trap placement may skew biofix calculations. Mating disruption reduces trap catch. That's true. What if the weather cools down after the first catch? Trapping allows you to understand and confirm model predictions, even if they match perfectly. And it shows how the numbers are building and how they line up with the model. Trapping data allows you to have a high degree of certainty that the model is in sync with your orchard and the spray recommendations will be accurate. Consistent trapping will allow you to see patterns in the population over time and assess when or if something has changed or gone wrong with the control program. If things are going well with the methods that you're using, stick with it. But if you're getting stings and you're not sure why, increasing trapping is the first thing that you should try. Trapping is too expensive. So this math is provided by Mike Dorr. He calculated that one trapping station is about $35 a year to operate. At one trap every two and a half acres, it comes out to about $15 per acre. If you save just one spray every three years, that trapping pays for itself. So here again, if you're not getting damage, great. But if you have a block that is struggling, the time and money that you spend on adding some traps can easily pay for itself. Trapping provides relative population density. Estimating absolute pest density has always been the goal of insect monitoring. The current action thresholds we have are two to three moths in a trap for two consecutive weeks indicates the need for a spray for the first generation. Years of work went into these current action thresholds, and these action thresholds were established by trapping and assessing fruit injury, and they're still effective numbers today. 
In fact, the research in this paper that I'm showing here shows how to estimate populations using trapping. The predictions and the calculations based on that agree and are in perfect alignment with the Jay Bruner recommendations that we currently still use. So I believe that this is data from 100 traps placed in a 20 acre block that shows the actual catch data over a short period of time. We see that emerging populations can be unevenly distributed throughout the block. So where do you put the trap? Well, if you put the trap here on the corner, you can see that a single trap placed in the wrong location would give an incomplete picture of actual cotyle mouth pressure. More traps gives a better picture, but placing traps just on the corners of the block where they're easy to drive up to and check still misses much of the data. So here we're at one trap every two and a half acres. So some things to remember, traps should be placed on the interior of the block, not just on the edges. If you are struggling to get control in a block, it's important to move the traps around. Get into the interior of the block, identify hot spots, and sometimes it feels like as soon as you figure things out, things change. Coddling mouth management is dynamic and it changes from year to year. If you're catching zeros or low numbers and you're still getting stings, you need to change tactics. Increase the number of traps or change trap locations. Research has shown that one trap every two and a half acres gives you the best measure of coddling mouth populations. What about hand applied mating disruption? So here the red dots indicate hand applied mating disruption. Allures are competing with the females and with the traps. So all things being equal, you should expect to catch less in a mating disruption orchard. Using the 10X lure should make traps more attractive without changing action thresholds. Remember mating disruption works best when populations are low. So find and control hot spots in the orchard for mating disruption to work its most efficiently. What about mating disruption with aerosol emitters? Aerosol emitters put out large volumes of pheromone, and we have shown that they shut down traps downwind for many meters. These data are from a walnut orchard with some work done in California, and you can see how the black dots represent the traps, and you can see how the aerosol emitters shut down catch in most of those traps to the right. It's important to remember that these emitters are still disrupting moths through competitive attraction. So they are not dead, they are not overwhelmed with pheromone, and they're still out there searching for females. Here they show high catch numbers upwind of this trap. I show a paper here by Dr. Pete McGee that shows the aerosol emitters are still a competitive trapping mechanism. So it's, it's, still, it's still a numbers game. It's important to remember. So monitoring traps should not be placed downwind of aerosol emitters. If you have a block and you're getting zeros in the monitoring trap, but you're still getting stings, you may want to relocate that trap. They need to be placed upwind of the aerosol emitters. And this data here is not real. The heat map that they've drawn from the zero mark there, the next set of traps is 800 feet away. And there's no actual data in between there. So my point is that you don't need to be 800 feet away from that aerosol emitter. If you hang a trap just one row or one or two rows upwind of that aerosol emitter, we have seen this in our research that you will get catching that monitoring trap. Traps can measure the impact of spray programs. Trapping and scouting are critical for assessing efficacy of controls. You can see here in this picture that the distance from where the egg hatched to the entry hole can be extremely small. This distance is the window for larvicides to be effective. So even if you do everything perfectly, there's still a chance that you can get injury. Coverage is critical. An incomplete spray coverage can definitely lead to damage. This picture is trees that were sprayed with a fluorescent marker, and they're being viewed under a black light. And you can see that this apple on the right did not get hit with the spray and is likely going to lead to damage. So trapping and scouting can help identify these kind of problems and help you react in real time. And finally, traps can monitor the size and the timing of later generations. The model is still an excellent tool, but pesticide sprays and unusual weather can sometimes skew the actual moth flight from predicted. This is just two unusual years. This is data from Mike Dorr. In this instance, monitoring traps can alert you to the fact that the timings are off and give you an opportunity to adjust in real time. You know, here in the Pacific Northwest, typically we've had two and a half generations per year. With warmer weather, we're now closer to a third full generation. Predicting the size of the third generation can provide information about next year's pressure and tell you how successful this year's spray program was. The take home message for today's talk is trapping and scouting are critical for integrated pest management, measuring biofix, estimating populations, measuring the impact of sprays, 
monitoring the timing and the size of later generations, and most importantly, it gets you out in the field and trapping can be fun. It's a little picture of Larry Goot with his son when he was just a little one. I'm happy to take any questions, and I appreciate you listening to this talk. Thanks. Thank you.